Heute an Puru. Sounds. Inga reo, inga mana, raranga tira ma, tēnā koutou katoa. You're with the Moments in Time, a podcast series for Sounds, Centre for New Zealand Music, Thoi Te Arapuoru, ko Charlotte Wilson, aho. It's February 2020. Coronavirus is sweeping the world. China has been in lockdown since January, and New Zealand Chinese composer Gao Ping is in his hometown of Chengdu, writing a piece in memory of Li Wenliang, the doctor who alerted the world to the presence of COVID-19 and was then one of the first to die. It was the 6th of February, 2020, and here is Gao Ping in China to talk about that bitter cold night. been in lockdown for two weeks at that point. I think on the 22nd we heard about uh, the lockdown. Um, then it happened. And very quickly it happened. Uh, there were news about this. We heard about things like this, but nobody took it very seriously, actually. Uh, everybody's out on the street and uh, in the restaurants and everything was normal. But then after the 23rd, we were all locked in, just like, you know, uh, like that. Happened quickly. Yes. And what was your experience of lockdown like? Yours personally? Well, I was lucky, uh, very, very lucky, first of all, that uh, I was with my family. And also that uh, I guess I'm a kind of a mostly indoor person anyway, kind of, you know, so... So I just stayed in and uh, found uh, plenty of things to do at home. But the atmosphere of the, of the lockdown is, uh, you know, you are a little frightened of what's happening. And nobody seemed to, seemed to know the, what the virus could do to people, actually. It was un, really unclear at the time. And people say, oh, it's in the air. And when you go outside for a walk, you can <laughs> contract it. And... So all these crazy things, nobody could uh, be sure. So we just stayed in most of the time. Um, Were you getting much news from the authorities? Yes, of course you do. Yes, but uh, news from the authorities are always taken with a grain of salt. (laughs) (laughs) As everywhere, and particularly in China, I would say. So we try to follow other sources, which are very unreliable as well. So uh, we just hear these rumors and all these gossips, really. Um, but I, I also get on some like BBC and just check uh, what's going on. But th- there's not much mm. until later. Then every day is like full of uh, uh, pages of, uh, of that. Yeah. So it, we were living in a kind of um, kind of a lost world. We we didn't know what to do, but except staying home. And there was a time that uh, people tried to buy a lot of food and uh, you know things like that. We even did that at midnight, going to a shop and uh, bought some rice, of course, being a Chinese noodles and canned food, eggs, that sort of thing. Mm. We did the same thing in New Zealand, of course. Sure. Did you immediately go to online teaching your students, giving, giving them online lessons? Well, uh, school didn't start until late February. We had a long winter break. So we just stayed in most of the time, uh, except for occasional, you know, adventure out for a walk in the streets. And the streets were quickly abandoned, completely nobody. It's like ghost town. Like uh, overnight, it became a ghost town. Nobody goes out uh, and everybody wears uh, masks. So it was really strange, strange feeling. Feels like everything stopped, the clock stopped. New Zealand Chinese composer Gao Ping, currently professor at the conservatories in Beijing, telling us about his bitter cold night in memory of Dr. Li Wenliang.
So tell me about that bitter cold night of February the 6th. Oh, well, it started with a, a friend of mine, a pianist. Um, he uh, texted me and he said, well, uh, as a composer, as a musician, don't you have anything to say about our current time? You know, he kind of provoked me. And I said, yes, I'm writing some music. And he said, well, I have a suggestion. Maybe you should write a piece for violin and piano because he plays with his violinist. And uh, that was on the day of the 6th. Huh. <laughs> and uh, of course, that night, you know what happened. Uh, Dr. Li Wenliang passed away that very night. Were you already aware of him? How did you learn about Dr. Li Wenliang? Well, mostly on social media, because he, run, he ran a um, microblog, we'd call it, and he posted things there, and he posted that he was sick, you know. Um, of course, he was uh, already well known at that point, being one of the first to warn us about the virus, and he was, in fact, got told off by the authorities, you know. Yes, um, he had to sign a retraction. He had to sign a retraction, um, yes. So... That's how we learn about him, and it's a bit tragic, and it's a little bit ironic, you know. First, he was announced a liar and on the TV, you know, nationally. Um, I don't think they point his name out, but there were eight people who, who were kind of uh, accused of uh, spreading lies. Really? Um, so when you turned on the television, then there would be a segment saying, this is one of the yeah, people spreading false rumors? Yes, yes. They didn't name names, but uh, he was one of the eight, I think. Yeah, definitely. So we were really worried about uh, his life. I mean, on the 6th, and he was uh, basically in critical condition, and everybody was following that, that news. Even his death, the time of his death was unclear to us, because uh, I think earlier in the evening, maybe 9 or something uh, in the night, uh, they announced he already passed away. But then later, some more news came in and said, oh, they were still trying to save him. So we, anyway, he, he, he died that night sometime. And, Conflicting uh, reports. Yes, very confusing, yes, huh? Very confusing. And it seems very strange, that whole thing. In fact, he didn't even post anything publicly. He posted a message into a WeChat group of people, his friends, doctor, his, his colleagues. Uh, I think... He he knew the danger of uh, posting it to, to actually tell the public, but he, he wanted to warn his friends. But then the news, of course, spread very quickly. Mm. He seems to have been such a likable person. I know, yes. Also, he was very optimistic towards the very end. He, he announced, uh, he said, uh, oh, finally, you know, the dust, the dust, he called the dust, came down to the ground. I'm diagnosed, he said, you know, so, huh. so I didn't, uh, I didn't go to bed very late and uh, didn't sleep very well. And it was, the emotion was so complex and very angry and sad and uh, helpless and all that things. Then the next morning I thought about my friend's suggestion to write the piece. I thought, well, this, I had to, I had to write about this, this feeling, reaction to, to what happened the previous night. Yes. And that uh, morning uh, when I started to write the piece, I uh, also uh, was aware of a photo that was passing around um, China uh, on social media. Someone wrote uh, farewell to Li Wenliang on a snow bank, uh, river bank, huge Chinese letters. Uh, it was a beautiful image. Um, so that was also uh, a further stimuli, you know, to, to the piece, to writing the piece. So you were sad, angry, confused, but also inspired to write this piece. Is that how inspiration usually comes to you? Well, this is a kind of a special case. I don't think I've ever in my life uh, encountered that experience before because because that was so direct, even though I didn't know him personally, uh, but uh, I was living in the same 
situation as he was and uh, very much I could feel how he must have felt of course he was actually getting very sick you know and uh, dying um, that I could only imagine and the whole business with his uh, being brave and uh, trying to tell the truth which was a hard thing at the time and uh, in a place but he went ahead and did it anyway and you know still today I I think there's people still leaving messages to him on his uh, blog you know which is kind of it's a powerful thing to think about which was kind of true everybody left uh, messages all sorts of messages nothing to do with him sometimes to just to tell that oh i had lunch i'm feeling sad uh, you know my girlfriend left me and it's amazing it sounds as if he's become a real focus for china's grief yeah. yes huh. uh, yes i'm happy with the piece because it's uh, it's so direct and uh, simple and uh, austere and uh, first one of the first pieces that felt i was not writing as a composer, but as a just a person reacting to emotions completely and truly. Uh, that's that's what I felt. <laughs> You're listening to episode one of Moments in Time for Sounds with composer Gao Ping talking about his piece Bitter Cold Night. And in fact, the Chinese online premiere was plagued with problems. The violinist pulled out, explaining their feeling that it was inappropriate for the nation's struggle against the virus, not voicing the right kind of tone. And so in the end, it was premiered online from the States. And it's two New Zealand musicians, violinist Amalia Hall and pianist Stephen De Pledge, who we're hearing in this recording. And Gao Ping is a Chinese citizen. How does that make you feel about the authorities? How do I? Well, I'm, I'm used to it. Yeah. <laughs> it might, it might have some consequences, but I don't think it's going to be anything because you know, piece of music, it doesn't, it doesn't come too much. But really, even as a composer, mm. you feel this constant sense that you have to be careful of what you write. Well, I could write anything I like. Uh, given that the title or the text don't uh, contradict, <laughs> or you don't make uh, you don't make fun of the national anthem or something, but uh, yes, I think people have this in mind. Though it's it's a highly sensitive, a highly alert uh, public. Huh. You know. And. For yourself, how do you manage to distill these emotions into music? Oh, that's a hard question because uh, you know how music works. Music is uh, is uh, is another reality, another space, which has its own kind of laws and uh, its own narratives which has a, some parallels to ours, but uh, it's something else. So uh, basically it's completely intuitive. You know, I, I sit at the piano, I, I, I feel, well, there is something I want to write, but what is it? What is it? I tried a few things and finally this thing. I thought, I think I can go with this one. And it stops and goes. It's it, it's very hesitant. The beginning of the piece, the whole hesitance of speaking, ah. uh, searching, searching for words, is something like uh, someone is lost with words. And then later, when the first idea came back, it was also fragmentary, but. Uh, like outburst, there was some some stronger moments, you know, and then at the very end, the violin plays very high harmonics. Well, they called him a whistleblower, but uh, well, when I used the harmonics, I didn't think that uh, really. But uh, now, <laughs> looking back at the piece, yes, they were whistles, you know, 
um, from far away. Gao Ping, the New Zealand Chinese composer, telling us about his bitter cold night. In memory of Dr. Li Wenliang, now declared a national martyr by the Chinese government and dedicated to the whistleblowers of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020 sweeping the world. This podcast was presented and produced for Sound Centre for New Zealand Music, Toi Te Arapuoru, by me, Charlotte Wilson. Thank you for listening. The performers we've heard on this recording were Amalia Hall, violin, and Stephen DePledge, piano, recorded separately in the middle of lockdown in their homes. Sound production by RNZ Concert, rnz.co.nz slash concert. To hear more about Gao Ping and A Bitter Cold Night, and for more information, go to the Sounds podcast website, sounds.org.nz. That's S-O-U-N-Z. Norera. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā tātou katoa. Toi te arapuru, sounds.